Good morning and welcome to Compass Daily and welcome to Friends of Compass Week. Our mystery guest speaker today is Kayla Hurst. Kayla was on staff at Compass and filled a variety of roles serving as our rooted pastor and our online campus pastor. Today, Kayla is the lead pastor of the San Francisco campus of Northgate Church in Northern California. You'll love Kayla's energy as she shares her amazing teaching gift this morning. I can't wait for you to hear Kayla right after we worship today. Welcome to Compass Daily. My name is Kayla Hurst, and I used to be one of the pastors at Compass, where the mission is navigating people to God. <laughs> Look at that. I've still got it. All kidding aside, I love you guys, and I miss my Texas family so much. I love seeing how God is working in and through you in ways that can only be explained as God's hand moving in your lives in church. So welcome to Compass Daily, this time from sunny San Francisco. I'm so excited we get to do this together. Let's start this way. Have you ever made a promise? Have you ever broken a promise? See, it's my experience that there are only two kinds of people. The kind of people who never ever break promises and the people who have children. <laughs> See, I've always considered myself to be a fairly trustworthy person, keeping my word no matter what. 
But then I had these little womb gremlins and I find things coming out of my mouth that are just ridiculous. Now, you should be warned that I have always had a flair for the dramatic when it came to threats. When they were little, it was things like, if you don't pick up your toys, I'm going to light them all on fire in the front yard. Listen, I was not about to light anything on fire, and honestly, I bought those stinking toys. If I got rid of them, I would just have to buy them more later. It's ridiculous. As they got older, I made the mistake of taking away their cell phones as punishment, only to realize that it was actually really helpful for them to have the phone when I was picking them up from school so I knew when they were done and didn't have to sit in the car for two hours waiting. All joking and bad parenting aside, sometimes a promise is broken due to circumstances that can't be avoided. That's where the phrase from the South, Lord willing and the creek don't rise came from. But when someone continually breaks his or her promises, it becomes clear that they can't be trusted. On the other hand, when a person always keeps his or her word, it's easy to look forward to their next promise with trust. Keeping promises builds trust, and trust is the best insurance during uncertainty. I don't know about you, but these last couple of months, I've wished that there was some kind of pandemic insurance available, something we could cash in to make all the uncertainty stabilize when the whole world seems shaky. But there's only one person I know of that has a 100% track record of keeping promises, and he has a pretty long record at that. Some of the very first promises we hear of in the Bible are the ones God made to Abram. God actually made several of them, and these were big ones. The Lord promised to build a nation through Abram by giving him descendants as numerous as the sand on the shore. He also promised that it was through those descendants that God would bless the whole world, all humans. And eventually, he would keep that promise through Jesus. But the promise I want to show you today is one that I have found particularly helpful during this collective season of uncertainty we're all experiencing. It's one that our promise keeper God embodies so intimately that it became one of the names we know him by. It's tucked in the middle of Abram's story, the time between God's promise about descendants and the fulfillment of that through the birth of Abram's son, Isaac. In Genesis 16, Sarai, Abram's wife, was 77 years old and her husband was 86. Honestly, Sarai was losing hope that God would fulfill this promise of children. Let's start in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai had said. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. I know. I know. You're saying to yourself, how could this possibly go wrong? <laughs> I know. Verse 6. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Hagar took off in the direction of her homeland to Egypt, out through the desert. Now, this was super dangerous. She probably didn't have time to gather a ton of supplies before she escaped, and she could have been taken captive by somebody else, or being pregnant, she could have lost the baby and her own life from traveling under these conditions. But eventually, she made it to a spring of water in the desert, and she sat down, exhausted. What was she going to do? Things had just started to look up for her. But now, even if she reached her home in Egypt and if she still had family living there, they would have been too poor to help her. She had to be confused. See, Hagar would have known about Abram's God. She must have wondered if that God knew or cared about her. Now, here she was, her future was uncertain, her past was too painful to think about, and she'd been abandoned by everyone on earth. And now, she felt overlooked by this God in heaven. And it's in that context that we read verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Do you see this picture of our compassionate God? He found this poor, confused servant girl in the middle of the desert. He found her and he met her right there. 
Then the angel gave her instructions, tells her what he wants her to do, and then says he will more than take care of her through the baby that she's carrying. And then this beautiful thing happens, and it can happen in our lives too. Hagar responds by giving a new name to God. You see it in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy, the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. I love that. Did you catch it? See, first God sees Hagar, but then Hagar sees God. Isn't that how it works with us too? God sees us wherever we are in the middle of our desert, our mess, our misery, no matter how dark and deep the place we find ourselves in. The psalmist says it this way, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. God sees us just like he saw Hagar. And in the same way Hagar saw God in his mercy, we can see him too. You see, sometimes it's in the middle of our suffering that we can most clearly see the God who sees us. I know that's easier said than done. And this is where our promise keeper God comes in handy. Remember, we said that when someone keeps their promises, it builds trust. And trust is the only insurance we have in the face of uncertainty. So when you're in the middle of your uncertainty and you're not feeling really trusting, maybe you're worn down or maybe the rug just got pulled out from underneath you. Everything is pushing you toward the edge of despair and you're hanging on for dear life. Or maybe, frankly, you're past that. You're down in the pit of it right now. You're actually in the desert with Hagar, hopeless and exhausted. Friend, This is the moment we preach the gospel to our feelings. We remind ourselves the ways God has shown up in the past. We tell our souls about the time he came through with exactly what we needed. We say to our fears that there is a God who sees us, who hears us, who knows us. Isaiah 43, 2, when I pass through the waters, God will be with me. And when I walk through the rivers, they will not sweep over me. When I walk through the fire, I will not be burned. The flames will not set me ablaze. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Y'all, we preach the gospel to our feelings until they catch up with the truth. And sometimes we even need help with that. When my first baby was born, my mom came out to stay with us for a couple weeks to help out. It was such a sweet time for a lot of reasons, but the lessons I learned from her during that time were priceless. One night, Mackenzie was having a particularly hard time staying asleep, as newborns often do. I was exhausted and my mom offered to stay up with her until she needed to be fed. I enthusiastically agreed to that arrangement and put myself straight to bed. It got quiet for long enough that I fell asleep only to wake up an hour later with more cries coming from the baby monitor on my nightstand. I started to roll out of bed until I heard the sound of my mom opening the door to the nursery. I heard her talk sweetly to my baby telling Mackenzie everything was gonna be okay. I heard her get her out of the crib and then start the process of changing her diaper. By the way, that did not make the baby any happier at all. After that necessary torture and underneath the angry cries of my newborn, I heard the distinctive sound of my mom settling into my grandmother's rocking chair. She rocked for a bit, cooing at a screaming Mackenzie, letting her know she was all right, patting her back, but this baby was having none of it. 
Then I heard my mom start to sing. Started out kind of quiet. It was mostly old hymns. She was singing. Mackenzie was crying. Mom sang louder, so Mackenzie cried louder. It escalated quite a bit, and I was about to get out of bed crying myself at this point. And then I heard it. Mackenzie got quieter, and then quieter, and quieter still, until all I heard coming through the baby monitor was my mom singing. Then I think we all fell asleep. The next day, I remember asking my mom how she did it. What did you do to make her calm down? She looked at me the way only moms can and said, Oh, honey, sometimes you just have to sing louder than they cry. Friends, this is why we need the church. This is why we need each other. Sometimes we have to sing louder than they cry. There are people in your community that can barely get the words out right now. Their world has been turned upside down in ways you can't even fathom. There are people watching right now, people that are a part of your church family that want to believe there is a God who sees them. They want to say God is way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, enlighten the darkness, but they can't even get through the first line of the song without weeping. This is when we come beside and behind them. We sing the truth for them until they can sing it for themselves. Sometimes we have to sing louder than we cry. So let's do it. I'm going to pray and then let's take a minute to sing this morning. Sing for yourself. Sing for the people who can't sing for themselves. And if you're one of those, let this song be sung over you. Let's pray. Father God, you are a good God. You are a loving God and you are a powerful God. Thank you for being our promise keeper. Thank you for being the God who sees us, who hears us, who knows us. Father, we trust you and we love you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
hope you loved Kayla as much as I did. That was awesome. Hey, thanks for coming to Compass Daily today. You know, as a staff, we always want you to know that we're praying for you. We love you guys. We're getting through this together. It's going to be awesome. We are so thankful for all the continued faithfulness in the ways that God has blessed you and I. So even though we're not meeting in a physical location, join me in continuing to be generous. When you and I continue our commitment in giving, it not only continues the work of the kingdom and the work of the church, it helps our community and impacts people around the world. In fact, with the food crisis in Haiti, because of your generosity, we're able to continue feeding hundreds of kids every day. You can continue to be generous to Compass by clicking on the Give button at the top of the video player or click on the link in the chat room or comment section, or you can simply text the words Compass Church to 77977. Hey, don't forget to stay connected to Compass Online for our worship experiences on Thursday nights and Sundays, and join us for Compass Daily all week, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. This is Compass Friends Week. Don't forget that. We are in this thing together. We're praying for you. Love you guys. Trusting our great God. Thanks for joining us at Compass Online today.